a seat. Welcome. Uh, it's so great to be back. If you're new, my name is Byron, and I get to serve as the lead pastor here. If you're a guest, anytime throughout the message, fill out one of those connect cards in the seat back in front of you, and we would love to be able to connect with you. Come say hi in the lobby. If you got your Bible, open up with me to Acts chapter 24, where we're continuing our study through the book of Acts that we are calling The Church where we're learning from the first church lessons that we can apply to our church so we can be the church that God has called us to be. And we are in Acts 24 today. And the sermon title is, Are You Ready to Blank? I'll fill in that blank for you in just a moment. But my question is, who's ready for football season? Y'all must be Cowboy fans because you don't sound excited. Just more disappointment for the boys. Uh, uh, how about this one? You're a Raiders fan. Don't even laugh. Um, how about this one? Uh, who's ready for the Olympics to be over? Anybody? Can we pretend that we aren't interested in sports that nobody really cares about? It's like, do I have to watch like synchronized swimming and women raving, you know? I mean, come on, like, right? We're like, oh, the Olympics. And you're like, nah, you don't really care about that. You just get excited for a little bit. Hey, next Olympics is in Los Angeles. Uh, and the only place that's more woke than France is LA. Uh, so <laughs> please pray for the future of our country. Speaking of, who's excited? Who's ready for the November elections? <laughs> Everybody else is like, do I have to? <laughs> it's like, I'm voting for Giant Meteor uh, or Jesus. Um, I hope that Jesus comes back first, may or not the Lord come quickly, but I have an entire sermon series coming up in the book of Jude that you're gonna love because it's all about, it's all about how we vote with biblical principles and how we continue to contend for the faith that was once delivered to us once and for all down to the saints. And so as a Christians, I'm making a joke right now, but let me say that voting is a civil responsibility and a right that we have, and we need to take that seriously. Yeah. Yeah. How about this one? Who's ready? Um, who's ready for one big Sunday? Woo! Come on. We rented the entire Jefferson Theater, and we're gonna have one big service, one big Sunday. We're all gonna worship Jesus together. It'll be the first time since our first year as a church that we're all gonna be in the same building in the same service. Isn't that amazing? And in here, it's gonna be kids takeover. So all the kids are gonna be worshiping in this room. Do you know that every week there's over 100 kids in the back at Redemption Kids? Isn't that amazing? And so August 25th, one big Sunday, the Jefferson Theater, invite a friend, come ready to worship together. And here's my final question, get ready. My question is, are you ready to repent? Everybody's like, oh no, the pastor said the R word. You know, repentance isn't a very popular message in the church today, but Martin Luther, when he launched the Protestant Reformation, he nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, and the first line is this, that the beginning and the end of the Christian life is one of repentance. That we begin with Jesus through repentance, we continue, we're sustained, and our life ends with Jesus in repentance. To be a Christian without repentance is not to be a Christian. The same way that fish swim, birds fly, Christians, we repent. And tragically, there's not a lot of preachers like Martin Luther who are ready and excited to preach a message over repentance today. It's not an easy message to hear because people get offended, people get upset. Oh, don't say repentance because then you might, you might hurt somebody's feelings. Well, the first words out of Jesus' mouth in Mark 1, when he comes on the scene, he says, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. The church launches in Acts chapter 2 with this message, repent and be baptized, every single one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. The Christian life begins and ends with repentance. And I think it's time for us to reclaim the word repentance because repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is actually a great thing. And here's what repentance is. Repentance is an invitation to change, 
The Greek word metanoia literally means to change, to change your life, to change your direction, to change your thinking, to change your mind, because that's what happens when you repent. Jesus comes and he changes your life. I'll give you a simple illustration that I use. When you're driving down the road and you got your Apple Maps open and you pass your exit, what does Siri say? Rerouting. That's Siri's way of saying, repent. Why? Because you're heading in the wrong direction. You're going the wrong way. You need to stop. You need to turn around and get on the right path. See, Jesus says it like this, that broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life. And some of you, you're heading down a five lane highway towards hell. You need to get off. You need to stop. You need to put it in reverse, turn it around and you need to repent because that's how God begins to change our lives. Here's your life, you're heading in the wrong direction. You're following your word, your will, your way, you're living in sin, your back is towards God. And then the Holy Spirit, through this message or maybe through an invitation by a friend, convicts your heart, you stop, you change, you turn around and now you're beginning to follow after Jesus. That is what repentance is. And every single one of us, we must reach the place of repentance. And so today I'm gonna ask you this question, are you ready to repent? And I'm gonna give you an opportunity at the end of the message to do so. And what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna look at Acts 24 from the perspective of Felix. Felix is the man we're gonna meet today. He's a governor over Judea, placed there by Rome, and he's standing in front of Paul and Paul calls Felix to repentance. And Felix refuses. He says, I'm not ready. Come back later. Come talk to me about it later. And eventually, as we'll see as the story unfolds, later never came. He was not ready to repent. And he missed the opportunity of a lifetime. And so I'm asking today, are you ready to repent? And tragically, many people, maybe you, are not ready to repent. And so what I wanna do is I wanna tackle four things that prevent people from repentance. I wanna give you four reasons that people don't repent. The first reason people don't repent is because of fear of man. Acts 24, one opens up like this. And after five days of the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesperson, one Tertullius. Now, if you remember over the last several weeks, Paul has been on trial. He goes into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple, he presents his tithes and offerings, he purifies himself, and they arrest him, they beat him, and they drag him out in front of a whole crowd and mob, and they try to kill him. And then they put him on trial, and he tells them, I'm a Roman citizen, you can't falsely try me, and so they send him up to Caesarea, which is where he is at currently today, and he's standing in front of the Roman governor over the Judean region. And he's on trial and they hired a lawyer to come and present a case against Paul. You know it's bad when the lawyers show up, right? And they laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullius began to accuse him saying, since through you we enjoy much peace. And since by your foresight, oh, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. Now here's the question, does he really mean that? No, he's, he's trying to flatter Felix. Like, do the Jewish people love Rome? No, because a little historical context, at this time, Rome was oppressing the Jewish people. They were living under Roman occupation, uh, occupation. taxes were outrageous, and they were living in sin, they were seen as unclean, they were governing them with might and rule and power, and and Felix was one of the worst governors that there was. Tacitus, one of the early Roman historians, he writes in his Annals of Rome, secular, listen, people are like, the Bible's made up. No, these are real people, verified. You can go through history and you can find that this man truly existed, this story actually happened. And so Tacitus writes about Felix, they called him wicked, called him corrupt, sexually perverted, depraved, and he was a tyrant of a leader. And his whole job was to oppress the Jewish people. And here we see this guy, he's like, oh, Felix, you're so amazing. Felix, you're awesome. Oh, we love you, Felix, we'll vote for you. If you would just do us a little bit of a favor. 
And so Felix, he gives into this flattery. He's like, oh yeah, I like what I hear and go ahead and, and keep laying it on thick. And so they begin and they lay these accusations, these charges. Here's what it says. But to detain you no further, I beg of your kindness to hear us briefly. They're gonna present three charges. For we have found this man to be a plague. He's basically a virus in our culture and society. He's ruining everything. Number two, that he... Um, stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. They're accusing him of being a cult leader. And Paul, as you know, he's a missionary. He travels around the world starting churches in Gentile regions. And what they're saying is that he has been undermining Rome because he's trying to overthrow Caesar. He keeps talking about there's a king named Jesus. We only have one king. His name is Caesar, right? And so he's trying to overthrow Rome. And then number three, he's offended us too because now we found him in the temple. He's profaning the temple. We found him profaning, so we seized him. We got him for you, Felix, don't worry. Public enemy number one, we just did you a favor. Now it's time for you to do us a favor. And by examining him yourself, you're gonna find out that everything of which we accuse him, the joy, everything, you're gonna find out everything that we've accused him for. Verse nine, now the Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And so there's a scandal, there's a trial, and then Paul's put up here, there's false accusations that have been made. And then all of a sudden, there's a riot that happens behind them. People are upset and outraged, they're offended. They've got on social media, there's a hashtag. It's all over NSBC. It's trending along the ticker at the bottom. Your friends at work are talking about it along the water cooler. He, he's on trial and everybody's angry and trying to cancel Paul. Sound familiar? Welcome to the United States of Rome. You need to understand that this is not an old book, it's an eternal book and it's timeless, therefore it's always timely. And we need to learn to not only read the word, but read through the word to examine the world we live in. And so this is what's happening there. Paul gets an opportunity to speak. And when the governor has nodded, allowing him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Notice here that, that Paul, he's not angry, he's not upset, he's not offended, he's cool, he's calm, he's collected, and he speaks with reason. This is something that we as Christians in our digital outrage age needs to understand, is that we have the truth. And so we don't need to lie or manipulate or flatter people or try to deceive people. Man, we just need to be honest and truthful, and we can do so in a way that is winsome in a way that is loving, in a way that is kind, without continuing to exasperate the outrage that we live in. And this is what Paul's doing. He's not lying. He, he doesn't say, oh, Felix, you're amazing. No, he says, Felix, you've been a judge here for a long time. That's true. But he didn't say you were a good judge or a bad judge. He just said, you're a judge. And now I'm gonna plead my case before you. Watch what happens. You can verify that it's not been more than 12 days since I went to Jerusalem and they did not find me disputing with anyone, stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Basically, Paul's like, hey, um, I've only been here for 12 days. Uh, I didn't have enough time to get the boys together for a riot. <laughs> But neither of them can prove what they're bringing against me now, but this I confess to you that according to the way, that's early Christianity, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything that is laid down by the law and the prophets, the Bible, and having hope in God, which to these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection both of the just and the unjust. More on that later. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience between God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms. He's making his tithes and offerings to his nation, presenting his offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, worshiping God without any crowd or turmoil. I was just minding my own business. They came, got me for some Jews from Asia, which by the way, Paul says, they ought to be here right now, but where are they? No, they're not here. Just like keyboard warriors on social media who can talk a big game in the comment section, but they're not there to actually confront you to your face. Hypothetically. <laughs> or else let them say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out, standing among them, it is with respect of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. Basically, Paul says, the reason I'm on trial is because I believe in Jesus. 
that I believe that Jesus died, rose, and one day Jesus is coming again. And for this reason, I am on trial before you today. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so give me just a moment to set up the historical context. Okay, what was Felix's sin? It was the fear of man. So Felix was a Roman governor over the region of Judea, which is where Jerusalem was. How did Felix get that position of power? Well, he was appointed by Claudius, who was the Caesar or king over Rome, because Claudius was friends with his brother. This is a form of nepotism or cronyism. Nepotism is when you hire a family member and cronyism is when a politician puts somebody with no actual authority or real responsibility into a position of power simply because of their friends and their relationships. And so Felix, he didn't actually earn this position. He was placed there because of the Caesar. And his number one job was to keep the peace in Jerusalem because Jerusalem at this time was a powder keg. It was basically like a stick of dynamite that was lit, waiting and ready to explode. Because the Jewish people, they lived under the tyrannical authority of Rome and they hated Rome. The only thing they hated more than Rome was Paul. But you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they tried to work through the legal system and the government to try to press down and to try to Uh, destroy early Christianity. And this is how this situation is going. And he's been placed there to make sure that there's no riots and to make sure that they don't make Caesar look bad because there had been several riots and even wars that had happened up the hundred years leading up to this. So um, the Maccabean revolution took place about a hundred years before Jesus and that was stomped out. There was another um, messianic type figure. Uh, I use that as a person of a deliverance who came to try to set the Jewish people free and they were also killed. Jesus was accused of being this same revolutionary, which is why Jesus was crucified on the cross. And 25 years later, we find ourselves in the same position and there is a riot and Felix has to make a decision. What do I do? Do I do what's right and let Paul go? Or do I try to keep the peace and give the religious leaders what they want? Because he knows if he sets Paul free, then everybody's gonna riot. And he's worried about losing his job. He's worried about losing his power, his privilege, his position. He's worried about losing his life. And Paul and Felix knows that if I make the right decision, then my life is going to change. Because honestly, that's what repentance is. Repentance is an invitation to change. And Felix doesn't want his life to change because he likes his life just the way that it is. He's worried about what people think. And so what happens is what we do is we are so worried about what people say, then we ignore what God says in his word. It's a fear of man issue. And some of you, that's what you struggle with. You struggle with fear of man, that you're worried about what people are gonna say, what people are gonna do, or what people think about you. If you finally decide, I'm gonna live my life for Jesus, what's gonna happen? You might lose relationships, you might lose friendships, you might lose your job. People may start saying negative things about you, mock you, criticize you, get in the comment section on your baptism post and tell you how terrible of a horrible person that you are. I mean, some of you, this is what you, you struggle with. Like, let's make it really practical. Like some of you you, 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 you know the gospel, you hear the truth, but you have been in a relationship you have no business being in. You're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you wanna get baptized, but they told you that if you finally start going to church, they're gonna break up with you. And you have five years invested in that relationship. And so you choose the boy over the Lord. This is a a job like you you wanna grow in God's word and so you've had this idea of, I wanna start a Bible study in the break room, but you know that if you do, then then you're gonna be passed up for promotions, you're not gonna get the raise, you're gonna be ostracized in the workplace and so you stay fearful and you stay afraid because you're worried about what people are gonna say about you. You wanna go to next steps, you wanna join team, you wanna join the church, but you you don't want anybody to know about it because right now in 2024, everybody's coming out of the closet except for Christians. You're the only ones who have to stay in the closet. Everybody else, well, they can come out and they can be celebrated, but not you, you gotta stay silent. I mean, we just saw this with the Olympics, okay? Let me just make it super practical, right? So the opening ceremony of the Olympics, they have that entire, you know, 
thing going on. And all of a sudden there's the last supper and people are like, there's drag queens reenacting the last supper. And then we post about it and then everybody jumps on and they're like, that wasn't the last supper. That was the feast of the gods. You Christians, y'all need to calm down and chill out. Y'all get so offended over every little thing. And I thought, oh, praise God. It was just a bunch of Drag queens dressed like demons, worshiping the god of sex, drunkenness, orgies, and chaos, while they're men dressed like women with their grapes hanging out in front of kids. That's so much better, isn't it? I'm glad it wasn't the Lord's Supper. It was just worshiping demons in front of the entire world. I feel so much better at it now. I was overreacting the first time. But what happens is, is you know what you saw, but you were afraid to call it out because you didn't want the woke mob to jump on your back and cancel you, criticize you, make fun of you because you were worried about what people were going to say. You have a fear of man issue. This is what Felix struggled with. He was, he was worried about what people said, so he ignored what was right, what was true, and what God says because that's what matters most. Listen, can I just tell you, that every single one of us is, is going to stand before the Lord one day and give an account for our lives. And when you stand before God, they're not gonna be standing next to you. There's nobody who's gonna be standing next to you. It's you and God, and you have to present your case to God the same way Paul is presenting his case to Felix. And in that moment, it's not gonna matter what people say. It's not gonna matter what you read. It's not gonna matter what was trending on social media. It's not gonna matter what square you posted on Instagram or hashtag you followed. It's not going to matter what you learned in school because on that day, the only thing that matters is what God says about you. Do not live in the fear of man. Instead, live by the fear of God. Let me tell you this, write this down. It's that you will never please God living for other people's approval. You can either do what was popular or what is true. But just because something is popular doesn't mean it's true. You're like, I wanna be on the right side of history. You could be on the right side of history and the wrong side of eternity. Listen to me, you will never please God when you're living for the approval of others. And so what are you gonna say on that day when you stand before the Lord? Because that day is the only day that truly matters. Jesus says it like this, He says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Don't fear people. You're like, but I I got online and they told me that one plus one equals racism. (laughs) I know that a man is a man and a woman is a woman, but I don't know what a woman is, so I'm voting for her. Because if I don't, then people are gonna be mad at me. I'm gonna be on the wrong side of history. No, you're gonna be on the right side of eternity. And that's what matters most. Don't worry about what people say, worry about what God says. And many of us, we refuse to repent and to live our lives for Jesus because we're worried about what other people are gonna say. The second thing is hardness of heart. It says, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off by saying, when Lysias of the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. What is he doing? Well, first of all, he's refusing to repent. He's passing the buck. I'm gonna let somebody else worry about that. I'm gonna gonna give that to somebody else. That's somebody else's responsibility. I don't wanna talk about it right now. I'll let somebody else come along and make the decision. That's what some of you do with your salvation. You're like, my grandma was saved and that's good enough. (laughs) My wife is a Christian. Close enough. Oh, my children go to church but not me. You're gonna let somebody else try to make a decision for you. Nobody can make the decision. It's your soul, it's your responsibility. I'll let them come down, then I'll decide your case. Then he gave orders for the centurions that he should be kept in custody, put him in prison, but give him some liberty and that none of the, that, and let his friends, um, that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. What is Felix doing here? Felix knows that Paul is innocent but he's too afraid to do the right thing. So he does put him in prison, but he tries to be really nice about it. He's like, I'm gonna put you in prison, but I'm gonna still give you some liberties though. Cause you know what? I'm just that kind of guy. 
I'm just a good guy at heart, you know. I'm just in a really tough spot right now. So, yeah, sure, I'm going to put you in prison, but, but look how nice I am. He's massaging his guilt a little bit. He's trying to ease his conscience. Yeah, sure, he's doing the wrong thing, but his heart's in a right place. No, he has a, a hardening heart. I'll show you, I'll show you why. Uh, the verse right here, it says, he had a very accurate knowledge of the way. What is the way? The way is, it's early Christianity because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. The early Christians called themselves the way. He has an accurate knowledge of the way. Now, how does he have this accurate knowledge of the way? Let me give you a little bit more history. Um, so he's the governor of Judea. Do you know who the governor of Judea was before him? Pontius Pilate. Do you know Pontius Pilate? The one who washed his hands, accused Jesus and said, what is truth? Which also happens to be the philosophical governing doctrine of the world we live in today. There is no truth. What is truth? Go ahead and make up your own truth. And so Pontius Pilate sentenced Jesus to death. And Felix would have gotten the briefing reports. Hey, there was this man named Jesus. We killed him, and then he came back from the dead. And now he's ascended to heaven, and nobody knows where he's at. And now there's all these followers who have committed their lives to him. Oh, yeah, remember in Acts 2, whenever the day of Pentecost happened, 3,000 people were believed and baptized, and the church grew? Yeah, Felix, he's familiar with that. He has an accurate knowledge of the way. And if this isn't Southeast Texas, I don't know what is. Because most of you, you have an accurate knowledge of the way. You were raised in church. You know better. You went to Awanas or Royal Rangers. You, you went to youth camp. Now you experienced the presence of God before. You have an accurate knowledge of the way. You got a praying grandma who has a journal with prayers for years that she's been writing and it's soaked in tears because she has been fasting for you since you went wild in high school. You have an accurate knowledge of the way. And yet, you still refuse to repent. And when you're pressed, you're just like, oh, I know who God is. Yeah, I know who Jesus is, of course. Like, I can quote you uh, a Bible verse. Um, I could tell you the Veggie Tale stories. Right, I go on Easter and Christmas, you know, isn't that an, enough? Like, like yeah, I, I have a relationship with Jesus, though I don't pray to him, I don't talk with him, I don't spend my time with him, I don't read my Bible, I'm not in fellowship with other believers, I'm not filled with the Spirit, and I'm not living my life for him right now. But I got a relationship with him. Like, you're like, I know who Jesus is, but can I tell you, like Felix, you can know Jesus without actually knowing Jesus? So, like, I know my wife. Or I could tell you all about her. I could tell you her favorite movies and flowers, her favorite snacks and food. I could tell her what she likes and what she doesn't like, her pet peeves, because I get on every single nerve she has. I can tell you all about her, but what if I don't actually like spend time with her and, and, and love her and romance her? Then do I actually really know her? No, see, you can know without knowing. And some of you know Jesus, but you don't actually know him. Why? Because your life hasn't been changed by him. To know Jesus is to be changed. Because listen, here, here's what Christianity is. Christianity is not information, it's transformation. Right? It's not about what you know, it's about who you know and what you do with what you know. Like, Christianity is not facts, it's faith. And some of you have head knowledge without a heart posture. You have information, but you don't have the transformation that God brings in your life because you are not genuinely, truly repentant and you haven't experienced change. You have an accurate knowledge of the way. And so when you hear a message like this, like Felix, you, you start to feel a little uneasy. You get a little convicted. But like Felix, what you're going to do if you don't truly make a decision is you're going to try to massage your guilt and ease your conscience through good works and good deeds. Let me show you what repentance is not. It's three things. Uh, repentance is not, number one, remorse. <laughs> I feel so bad. That's not repentance. The Bible says there's worldly sorrow that leads to death and godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Number two, it's not regret. 
I wish I wouldn't have done that. I, I want to do over. If I could just do that all over again, then I would do things totally different. I'm sorry that happened, but I, I, I would never do that again. Well, that's just regret. You're not sorry. You're sorry you got caught. And so what other people do is they run to religion. What is religion? Religion is your attempts to earn God's favor through your good works. So you're like, oh, like I know that I've sinned, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help a granny walk across the street. I'm gonna give some, you know, when I go to Taco Bell and they ask, would you like to donate a dollar for kids who don't have backpacks? You're like, press that, make myself feel a little bit better. <laughs> what are you doing? That's just religion. That's man's attempts to earn God's favor through good works and through good deeds. That's not genuine repentance. So what is repentance? It's three things, confession, contrition, change. Confession, the Bible says to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. Re confession, Jesus, I have sinned. I am a sinner. I need your grace. Confession. Two, contrition. This is where you humble yourself before the Lord. You throw yourself at his mercy. You invite him into rule and reign over your heart, which leads to number three, change that you are no longer going to live the way you live, do the things that you do, but you have changed. I'm not living my old life, I have a new life. The old is gone, the new has come, I've received forgiveness, so I'm gonna live by faith. Yeah. Confession, contrition, change. You had an accurate knowledge of the way. To be honest, this verse haunts me, especially pastoring here in Southeast Texas, because I love and care about so many of you, and I meet people, whether at the gym or the coffee shop or at my daughter's school, and I'm just, I, 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 I'm so worried for those of us who grew up in Southeast Texas because we've been inoculated by the gospel. Like, like in, a, in a vaccine, what they do is they take a little bit of the virus, they put it in, and then they inject you with it so you can build natural immunities. And I'm worried that so many of us have just enough of the gospel to not actually love Jesus. Because you're like, I know who Jesus is. I'm good. You know him, but you don't know him. And so how would I put this in a word to where when you look in the mirror, you're as haunted by this verse as I am? And here's how I wrote it for your notes. The distance between heaven and hell is the distance between your head and your heart. Like some people can be this close to heaven and still spend eternity in hell because they knew him, but they didn't know him in their heart. They had head knowledge without a heart posture. They had information without transformation. They had facts, but they never had faith. You made a decision with your head, but you never accepted him to be your savior in your heart. The distance between heaven and hell is the distance between what's in your head and what's in your heart. And like Felix, some of you, your mind is made up and your heart is hard towards the things of God. And like Felix, you say, when it comes to repentance, I'm just not ready. Because you have fear of man, you have a hard heart. Number three, because of lust of the flesh. After some days, Felix came with his wife. We're gonna talk about her. His wife is now in the picture, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Just interesting, fun fact. Um, her father was Herod, the one that got ate by worms earlier. And her grandfather was the one who killed Jesus. And her great-grandfather is the one in the Christmas story, the slaughter of the innocents. That's who her family is. And so when Jesus stood on trial, he stood between two people, Herod and Pontius. Who's Paul standing before on trial with? Herod's granddaughter and Felix, the one who took Pontius' place. And so now Paul is literally standing in the footsteps of Jesus. What is Paul going to say? How is Paul going to respond? And then he sent for Paul, and he heard him speak about his faith in Christ. And he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, the coming judgment, and Felix was alarmed. I think in the King James Version it said he was shooken, shooketh. <laughs> he shook. He, he, it, it pierced his soul. He was what we would call conviction. He was convicted. He talked about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. He was convicted, alarmed, and he said, go away from me for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. A few days after putting Paul into prison, Felix 
and his wife, they're like, hey, maybe we should, um, maybe we should hear him again. Maybe we should go back to church. Like, I'm just curious. Could you bring Paul out and let, let him tell us more about this faith in Christ? And so they bring Paul out and he's in chains and he stands before Felix and Drusilla. And they're like, hey, tell us more about this Jesus. And he says, absolutely. The greatest preacher the world has ever known, author of half of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, is standing right in front of Felix and his wife. And what message do you think Paul is going to preach? I'll tell you what he's not going to preach. You're so amazing, Felix, just the way you are. You don't need to change. You're, you're special, and God is, God is love, and he is so loving. Oh, and he, he knows you're a sinner, but you know what? That's just the way that you are, and so don't worry about it, because in the end, God's going to forgive you anyway. You're a special snowflake. <laughs> no, Paul says, mm, snowflakes melt in hell. Three messages. Righteousness, self-control, judgment. This isn't the message that you want, but it is the message that we all need. Like many people come to church and they, they want the feel-good, happy-go-lucky message. You can come back next week, you can get one of those, but this week is the message you get. Because the truth is, is if you love somebody, you tell the truth. And, and, and Paul is standing in front of Felix, and he, he tells the truth. And let, let me tell you about Jesus, but first let me talk to you about why you need him. Because you need righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness means you're right with God. Because the reality is, is that we are all sinners separated from God by nature and choice. The wages of sin is death. And we're all deserving of death. And right now in the world, the only sin is to say that there is sin. They're like, sin? What are you talking about, sin? This is just, this is just my opinion. This is just my life. This is just who I am. I was born this way. I'm not a sinner. I just made some mistakes. No, you're a sinner. And you know how I know that? Because when you look at yourself in the mirror, deep down in your heart, you know that you're the biggest sinner in your life because no one sinned against you more than you have. You're not right with God. How is a person made right with God? Only through the shed blood of Jesus. That we're all sinners separated from God, worthy of death and hell and destruction. But God in his mercy sent his son Jesus that he could live the life we never could live, the perfect sinless life as the lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world to take away our sins. He goes on the cross where he shed his blood for you so that through him you might be declared the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin so that we you might become righteous so you can stand before God without being crushed. You really think you can stand before a living and holy God in the current state and condition you're in? You're not right with God. You need to get right with God. Number two, self-control. Why would he talk about self-control? Because Drusilla and Felix, they had a illegitimate, unbiblical marriage, and they lived in open, flagrant sexual sin. And so she was married to somebody else, and she was 15 when he saw her. He seduced her, stole her. She left her husband, married him, and they would have orgies and parades, and they would live their life open sexually in rebellion and perversion in front of the Jewish people. And Paul saw this, and he said, you know what you really need? You need self-control, and to put your pants on. <laughs> now, this is important because there's some Christians today who are like, you're, you're so compassionate that you no longer have convictions, right? So you look at like people who are living in, in sin or you look at sinful situations or deeds or you see the state of our, our culture and you're like, well, you know what? Pagan's gonna pagan, right? I mean, they're... We shouldn't expect non-Christians to live like 
God. And so let's just let them do their thing, right? And let's just put our head in the sand and let's just worry about our church and let's just read more theology books and let's just keep listening to our Christian radio and turn it up really loud, it's Caleb, so we don't have to listen to the sinfulness in the world. Let's just let them do what they're gonna do, right? We gotta be so, we gotta be compassionate. What does Paul do? You're nasty. He said, you're in sin. He leans in and he puts his finger right on his sin. That's sin. Because people need to be convicted of it. Number three, what happens if you're not right with God, you continue to live in sin? It's judgment. The judgment that is to come. Paul looks at him and says, you might be the judge today, but there's another judge above you. And you might worry about what Caesar is going to say, but there's a king above him who's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I will not bow before Caesar, but one day every knee shall bow before him. He says, you might be the judge now, but one day judgment is coming for you. And one day judgment is coming for all of us. And every one of us will stand before the Lord and we will give an account for our lives. And he is the living holy God who judges righteously the dead and the living and the just and the unjust. You might judgment? What judgment? Life is great. I mean, like, I'm just living my life. Like, I, I, I got a little money in my bank, right? I got a job, right? I'm in this relationship, and, you know, I, I, I can live my life however I want. And, you know, I'm a good person, and I like to go out and party and drink and have sex with whoever I want, and this is my nature and orientation, whatever it is. Man, life is great. What judgment are you talking about? I feel, I don't need God. I feel blessed. You know, the devil can bless too, right? And, and what you're doing is you're mistaking the kindness of God, which leads to repentance, for God's tolerance. But know this, God is not tolerant with sin. He is patient towards sinners. God is not tolerant. God is patient. And every day, apart from Christ, what you're doing is you're storing up wrath for the day of judgment. You say, wrath? I thought God was love. Yes, God is is love, but love is not God. The number one attribute in the Bible is God's holiness, that God is holy, he is holy, he is pure, perfect in all of his ways, that God is holy. And if holiness was a coin, on one side is love, the other side is wrath, and when you stand before the Lord, there will be a coin flip over your eternal salvation, and you either get wrath or you get love. And for every person who lives apart from Christ, what you are doing is you are storing up wrath for the day of judgment, where one day the wrath of God will be poured out and you will stand before him. And here's the question, who is going to take the wrath, you or Jesus? Because on the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied through the shed blood of Jesus in our place for our sins. God placed upon Christ the wrath that we all deserve. And if you are in Christ, then there is no judgment for you. You get God's grace and his love. But if you are not covered by the blood of Jesus, then you are living with the loaded gun up to your head, playing Russian roulette with your soul, waiting for the day that God pulls the trigger and you will experience the full weight of the wrath of God. Either Jesus takes your place or you suffer the wrath of God on the day of judgment to come. come this is the message. Not that we want, but the message that we need. Because God is not tolerant of sin. Like, do you know how much God, how much sin 
breaks God's heart. Do you know how much God hates sin? That he sent Jesus to die for it. If God didn't care about your sin, then he would have left Jesus in heaven and you would still be damned forever. But because he loves you, because he cares about you, he desires that none shall perish, but that all shall reach repentance. He has sent you to this church today to hear the message of repentance one last time so that way you can be saved. He sent friends and family members, camp counselors, youth group leaders. He has a friend for you at work who has been praying for you. You got a praying spouse or grandmother. You got a son who's back there at Redemption Kids who every week is like, Daddy, will you come to church with me? And because he is being patient towards you. He's so good to you. He's so patient to you. You got breath in your lungs because he's not done with you yet. Do not mistake God's tolerance for God's patience because one day you will stand before the judge and he is just and you cannot bribe him you cannot flatter him you cannot coerce him either Jesus dies in your place or you die for your sins. Number four, the love of the world. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. He said, could you like bribe me? Just give me some money. So he sent for him often and conversed with him when two years had elapsed. Two years. This went on for two whole years. Hey, Paul, come here, tell me about Jesus. Get away, I'm not ready. Hey, Paul, come tell me about Jesus. Get away, I'm not ready. Hey, Paul, come tell me about Jesus. Go away, I'm not ready. For two years, Paul was standing in front of him, the greatest preacher has ever been, and he still is not ready to repent. When two years would elapse, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. We'll talk about him next week. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Two years? I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not ready. Like, that's some of you. You're like, I'll give my life to Jesus on my terms when I'm ready. I'll, I'll give my life to Jesus later. I like my life now. I, I like the way things are now. I like the relationships, the sex. I, I, I'm not ready. I have too many questions. Listen, we can answer your questions later. You're like, but what about uh, the, the, the seven days of creation and the global flood? And, and you know, what about my sexual orientation or my, my gender and my pronouns? Listen, that doesn't matter. That's secondary. Right now, the only thing that matters is your soul. Let's deal with that first and we can answer the questions later, but let's get to the heart of the matter is you need to give your heart to Jesus now. I'm not ready. I like, I like well, maybe when, maybe when I get married and settle down and have some kids and my wife drags me to church, then I'll be ready. Maybe when I finally hit rock bottom in my addiction, but I'm not there yet, so I'm not quite ready. You know, you don't have to hit rock bottom. to give your life to Christ. But what, what was his problem? Fear of man, he wanted to do the Jews a favor. He's worried about what people said. Number two, hardness of heart. Two years, guys? Some of you, you've got hard hearts. You've been in church for two years. You've heard the gospel. You haven't made a decision. You've been in this church for two years. You've never been to Next Steps, joined a small group, come to a prayer meeting. You've been in the church for two years. You're not plugged in. You're basically living on the fence because you have a hardened heart. It said that he, he hoped that he could get a bribe. Could you just give me some money? Oh man, I, I just needed some money. I need some relationship. I need... Because ultimately, he loved the world. He didn't want to lose what he had gained. Jesus would say it like this. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Oh, he 
loved the world, the reputation, the relationships, the power, the sex, the, 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 the money. He loved his position of authority and power. He loved his life more than he loved the Lord. Because here's what happens. The world promises what only God can provide. The world will promise you, oh, you can have it all, but it's bankrupt. It's empty. That's why people have to do it more and more and more and, and more because nothing truly ever satisfies. The heart is an empty grave. The throat is an open tomb. And once you start feeding it sin, it will never be enough and it will continue to grow and grow until it consumes your entire life and you are bankrupt and you are broken and you are empty. And you know that because I'm speaking to your soul right now. The world has lied to you. It has promised something that it cannot give you. But God, on the other hand, if you're looking for love, there is Christ and his love for you. If you're looking for joy, there's a joy that could never be taken. There is a peace that passes understanding. There is a hope that is an anchor for your soul. There is life and life everlasting. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to everlasting life. And you are heading towards destruction you need to stop turn around repent and follow after Jesus say I'll do it later well the story is over but the Bible never mentions Felix again but history does in two historians, Josephus Flavius, who wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, and then a Roman historian named Tacitus in his Annuals of Rome, he writes about Felix. What happened after this? Felix, his greatest fears came true. He got fired. Next week, Festus comes in because his buddy Claudius, who was the Caesar, was murdered. Nero, comes in and fires all of the cronyism and all the nepotism and all of the appointments that the previous Caesar made, Nero comes in and fires them all. So he loses his job. He loses his money, his success, his reputation. He has to go back to Rome. Drusilla and his children die in the volcanic eruption of Pompeii. And then a few years after that, he dies of tuberculosis. Felix kept saying, maybe tomorrow I'll be ready. And then one day tomorrow never came. I'm going to say something and you're not going to like it, but that doesn't mean it's not true. And I say this with all the, all the love in my heart as, as your pastor. today, not tomorrow. Every single person in this room, I know you don't like thinking about it, but the truth is everyone in this room, unless Jesus comes back first, you will die and everyone you love will be dead one day too. The reality is, is no one knows when that day comes. I have preached funerals for infants. And I have preached funerals for the elderly. I have preached funerals for everyone in between. And my concern is this, you'll hear this message today and you'll make a decision tomorrow. But God has brought you here today to give you another chance today to make a decision today because the Bible says that today is the day of salvation not tomorrow not two years from now not ten years from now not when you get ready 
because no one is guaranteed tomorrow. What is life but a vapor? You are here today, you are gone tomorrow. In the grand scale of the history of time, your life isn't even as significant as the clip off the tip of my fingernail. You're here, you're gone, you're dead, and everyone will stand before God on one day. And we don't know when that day will come, which is why today is the day of salvation. Do not put off tomorrow what you know in your heart of hearts you are to do today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of the Lord. Today is the day you repent. Today is the day everything changes. Today is the day you go all in. You surrender and give your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. So my question for you is this, are you ready to 